Sounds Good is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it is the easiest way to make a podcast. When we were first getting started, getting ready to launch Sounds Good in 2015, making a podcast was hard. But now, thanks to Anchor, making a podcast is not only easy, it is fun. Anchor's creation tools allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and basically everywhere else. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Plus, now you can add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. Even if you're an OG podcast like ours, you can record and produce your show like you always have, but use Anchor as your host. You'll save money, have a superior hosting experience, and get advanced analytics. Anchor has everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. If you've been listening to Sounds Good for any length of time, you know that we believe small actions can make a big difference. Turns out that many of the world's most notable activists started their journeys the same way, by taking one small step at a time. This is Sounds Good. I'm Brandon Harvey. Today's guest is journalist and photographer K.K. Otteson. You've probably seen her work online or in the Washington Post magazine where she contributes regularly. She photographs and interviews activists and world changers, sharing their stories of overcoming obstacles to create progress in creating a better world. Her new book, Activist, features people I'm sure you've heard of including Stacey Abrams, John Lewis, Tarana Burke, Edward Snowden, Bernie Sanders, Gabby Giffords, Angela Davis, and many more. I sat down to talk with KK about what we can learn from the world's most notable activists. Through her interviews, KK learned that for most activists, their first step was motivated by nothing more than having hope for a better future, something that resides in all of us. In essence, Activists are nothing but regular people who decided to take action. I loved getting to learn from the stories of the activists that came before us, and I hope that this conversation inspires you to carry on the work that they started, or even start your own work. So without any further ado, let's jump straight into this conversation. KK, I am just so excited to be able to talk with you today. From the top, uh, how did the idea for the book come about? Where did the inspiration come from? The idea for the book came about, you know, something that had percolated in my head for years. I had studied political theory undergrad and sort of been interested in the role of um, activism in society. But then more and more in recent years, you know, over the last, what, two, three, five years, seeing the um, the deterioration of the discourse in this country and, you know, just feeling like there was the ideals that we were trying to uh, reach for as a country. We were really, we were not even hearing each other. We're not listening to the stories. There's vilification and there's no forward progress with that. And so I thought it would be interesting and, you know, inspiring to talk with people who really put themselves on the line and who you know, in moments where there was this um, difficult moments in society, figured out a way forward. But specifically to talk with them, you know, to really personalize those stories, those decisions, you know, so it isn't sort of this polarization, but rather understanding people, where they came from, you know, what their story is and why they chose to put their life on the line or they dedicate their life to these causes you know, and the, the way I structured the book the way it is with, with sort of a very close portrait of each individual or several so that you feel like you get the chance of sitting down to talk with them. You know, and so again, just talking person to person, you know, so that we see each other's humanity and we sort of separate it from these polarizing, you know, big ideas and yet celebrate the courage that it takes to stand up for something you believe in, you know, especially when it's not popular. And so what I tried to do is speak with um, activists from across the spectrum and across the generations who had been standing up for issues in a variety of ways about what it was that led them to take action in the first place. 
and then sort of thoughts on their journey and then also on the current moment. I found that your book was really driven by that inciting incident that led activists to feeling like they needed to do something. Did you find a common thread among, you You mentioned it earlier, that it was a really diverse group. Did you find a common thread among these diverse activists that you interviewed? Yeah, you know, Brandon, I think I did want to focus on those moments that, you know, made people stand up and and speak out. But what I found that was so interesting is that in so, so many of the stories, almost to a story, that happened when they were young. You know, there was something mm. in their life when they were young people. And it could be, it could be as young as, you know, grade school or it could be early teens where they just, something happened where they, it either just really pricked their conscience or often it did that. And they took some small action that led them to believe that you, that your actions can have effect. And so, you know, whether that's Al Sharpton talks about being, uh, you know, growing up in a sort of middle class area of Queens, nice house, and then his family went through some troubles and a divorce and ended up um, living in the projects, you know, a year later and just found such a different world than the, the comfortable world that he'd known, you know, even down to the fact that they didn't even pick up the trash in the neighborhood. And he was so appalled by that and so incensed that he, d- he organized a little band of 10-year-olds um, to pick it, <laughs> which is great. And, you know, they, he says we weren't, you know, successful, actually, but just the idea that you can speak up and you're listened to, you're seen, you're heard, we just, just opened up a doorway for him. And many of the activists talked about that. Cecile Richards of Planned Parenthood and now Supermajority also talks about being a seventh grader, you know, new kid at a at a new school and she gets on the school bus and there had been a, there was going to be a Vietnam war protest. And so she had decided to wear a black band, which people were doing that on her arm. She didn't know anybody at the school. So she's on the school bus, first day of school. She's really nervous. She said, I was a kid who did the right thing and, you know, good kid, never got in trouble, but she felt like she had to do that. And so she gets to school and immediately she's pulled over by the principal and, you know, she's nervous, but at the same time, she's thinking, wow, just by this, wearing this little thing, suddenly I have someone's attention. So just the power of protest or speaking out, you know, at a young age just makes you think, wow, you know, sort of if you push on the world, it moves a little bit. You have to believe that something will happen or you don't bother, right? So they got that idea, that sense of agency when they were young. That is fascinating to think about recognizing that you do have power. And also you kind of mentioned this in your intro, you talk about how Every individual that you interviewed, one of the attributes that they carried was that they had an abiding hope of a better future. And so it's interesting to think about imagining the world as it could be or should be, and then them taking one step to create that and recognizing that, oh my gosh, I am one step closer. It actually is potentially possible. Yes. No, I think that's right. And you do see that something happened because, you know, we have, I think we have often this perception of the activist is this angry, strident person yelling, you know. <laughs> and, you know, when you really think about it, and certainly when you talk with these activists, you realize that it's a very hopeful crew, right? You have to be something of an idealist, but maybe a pragmatic idealist. You know, you have to believe that it's possible, as you said, that you can envision a different future. Um, and then you have to be committed to just taking the steps, one step and then another step. And then it becomes a pattern, you know, because a lot of the folks in this book are well known now, but certainly when they started, they were not. It's not like they had massive following, tons of money, whatever it is, you know, positions of power. They didn't, you know, almost nobody did. They started because it was important to them because it was just this little, little action that they took. And then other people join them and they join in and sort of, you know, over the years we come, we now know that they're all quite well known, but sometimes it's hard to go back and see where they started as just a regular person like any of us who decided to take action. You know, it's interesting. Some of the people I was speaking to one of the activists in the book, who's very well known and was talking about, you know, well, I know some of the people in the book and I had no idea their backstories. Like I didn't know how they got involved. Because they, you know, they only sort of come into most of our consciousness much later in their lives after they've done all these things. Yeah. So for those older activists who, you know, you interviewed them later in their lives, how do you think that they maintained a sense of hope through all the years? Did you get any idea on, on what it took to, to keep that hope despite having to fight for progress for 
a long, long time. No, I, that's a great question. And that is something I really wanted to learn from them because you do have many of the actors in this book who have been active for more than half a century. You know, and in some ways I felt sort of bad talking with them. Like, you know, you've dedicated most of your life to these causes and we're still not further along. And it sort of felt like I wish we were, you know, for their sake. But you see people like Harry Belafonte, again, you know, he helped organize the March on Washington. He was a great supporter of Martin Luther King Jr. and many, a SNCC, uh, many issues along the way. And he's still at it. And he's still, you know, in his 90s is still talking with people. He helped the organizers of the Women's March. You know, they came to him and they said, how do we do this? You know, and he was, he helped them. You know, he, he does that with a lot of young um, artists, musicians who are trying to speak to social issues through their work. So he's still engaged. And, you know, you talk to people like that, or you talk to Gabby Giffords, you know, and talking about how inspired they are by the young people, by the younger generation's efforts. And the fact that I think they have a perspective on it, that it's, these are not problems that are maybe ever going to be solved or certainly solved by a generation. And then, okay, you move on, you rest on your laurels. Like that's not how they are. They're sort of forever problems. And so many of them sort of cited the sense of responsibility to do your part in your generation so that you can hand it to the next generation, hand the baton, and then they take it forward. You know, and you can't, and and emphasize the importance of having people know history so that they realize that that's part of what they need to do. Yeah, I wrote down this quote because it, it really stuck out to me. It was from Harry Edwards. And he said, the obligation is not to win the war. It's an impossibility. But to make our contribution in terms of winning the battles we're confronted with. Because that keeps the next generation from having not only to fight their battles, but the ones that we should have fought. And I thought that was so compelling and interesting and helpful to think about, okay, we aren't, we will always have to fight for the change we want to see in the world. And that will continue forever, but we all have our current role to play. And it's our responsibility to be a part of that today. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. He says it so eloquently. And I think that it is, you know, you build on something. So, you know, he he and also Harry Belafonte. So even though this struggle is perpetual, you know, you do make progress, you know, you do move forward, but it really does take everybody doing fighting their own fights, fighting the fight that their generation is faced with, you know, on the shoulders of of the last generation and with their wisdom, really. And so I think that that's, I think that's an important point because we tend to think like, okay, boom, let's uh, civil rights solve that, you know, clearly not, you know, or women's rights or whatever you want to say, but you can make progress. You know, it does bend towards justice, but it really, it's a long journey and you have to do your part or there's the backsliding. And I think, you know, that's, Certainly progressives would say that that we've seen a lot of that in recent years. In the process of, of you putting this book together, collecting these interviews, doing these photos, I'm curious as a photographer, a writer, a communicator, did you have a particular story or interview that most resonated for you on a personal level? Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, the quick and snappy answer is that really is whoever, whoever I just spoken with because, and that's almost <laughs> true. Yeah. It's true though. Cause you know, you go into these lives and you sit down with these folks, you know, many of them sort of mighty icons who, you know, you've heard about, you've studied before, and then you meet them and you sort of get to hear their story. And it's just a tremendous privilege, but just also just really person to person to sit down and be part of their journey. You know, I think, so really, I mean, Everybody was amazing. And, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, you see this both visually as a photographer and then also, you know, listening to the stories, you know, these the images, the, the stories stay with you and shape you. I mean, it's sort of like somebody giving you advice, you know, it's, they stay with you and they, they color the way you see the world. When I spoke with John Lewis at his office, you know, that was incredibly moving. And I, the picture that I have in the book, which is really one of my favorites, it's on the inside cover um, under the jacket. It's one with his eyes closed. And to me, that's, I think that's actually my favorite photo in the whole book and one of my favorite I've ever taken. Because we were sitting there in his office and he was, he was talking about Bloody Sunday, crossing the Pettus Bridge, you know, being attacked by, you know, police, you know, being attacked previously by the Klan. 
and just, you know, this going through these experiences, you know, all in hopes that he is carrying the torch for onward, you know, that his parents and his grandparents had started to make voting rights a reality. It was just beautiful because you you sort of, his eyes would sort of flutter closed. And so I have a picture of him with the eyes closed and he's got a deep crease between his eyes and you really just feel like you're pulled into the vortex of his memory there. And for a moment, you kind of share it. And it was really, it was just a profound moment for me. That is so beautiful. And it's such a, a stunning image. I think even those who haven't seen the image yet can kind of picture him doing that because I feel like he he does embody that so beautifully. What is your hope for people who read this book and learn from these stories? What do you want people to take away from this experience? Yeah, a few things. One is inspiration. I would like people to be inspired by these stories, by the courage um, that these individuals exhibited. You know, again, across the spectrum, you may or may not agree with what they did with their with the positions they were uh, behind. But the fact that as human beings, they cared enough and sacrificed enough to try to move the ball forward on something. So I think, Mm. you know, respect. And then inspiration also that it's possible. You know, everyone's just a regular person who, you know, as Dolores Huerta talks about, it's it's a series of decisions. Like she said, I, you know, some people say people are born leaders. I don't think that's the case. I think people become leaders. They're made leaders because they make the choices, you know, and they sacrifice their most precious resource, which is their time. You know, when she talks, she had 11 children and she sort of moved into the poverty of the fields to to advocate on behalf of the farm workers. And so, you know, just the fact that, you know, she went to those meetings, she held those meetings in the evenings, you know, when she could. And so for the rest of us in the world who are thinking, oh, gosh, I don't want to go to this meeting this evening. You know, I'm tired. I got to feed the kids, whatever it is. You think like, okay, she had 11 children and she managed to go (laughs) and she managed to leave these like, I can go tonight, you know, just do it. So sort of inspiration there and maybe a little accountability, but also just, you know, listening to quote the other side. I think one of my favorite um, comments that I got from someone who came to one of my readings, they wrote me afterwards and said, I went home right away and I read, before I let myself read the stories of all my, my own activist heroes, I forced myself to read the stories of the people I didn't agree with. And I thought that was great because I think, you know, the most important thing is, you know, recognizing the humanity. I mean, there are we, we will have differences of opinion. That's fine. But everybody is fighting for a better world. I mean, I suppose if you talk to sort of people, you know, proponents of hate, maybe that's not the case. But, you know, these folks, they may have differences with you, but they really, you know, they'll push you. And so just the, the challenge to ourselves, you know, to, to readers, to people listening to the stories is to say, okay, you know, I hear you as another human being and I'm going to push myself to actually listen to you and not just come in with my preconceived notions, but really listen. You know, and I, I sitting down with um, Jeannie Mancini of uh, March for Life and then Cecile Richards of Planned Parenthood, you know, I did each of those and I just thought, man, if I could, if these two folks could just get in a room together, there's so much overlap, right? There's so much for women's health that could be done for women's rights, for women's health. And there's some issues that will never be agreed on and that's fine. But the fact is that if we work together, you know, we can get a lot done because there is significant overlap. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, KK is sharing how literally anyone can be an activist and how you can take your first step to making a difference. That's more simple than you might think. We'll be right back. Sounds Good is sponsored by... Riff, can you imagine if you took peaches, avocados, and plums and threw away the fruit only to use the pit? Well, that's exactly what's done to the coffee bean, which is actually not a bean, but it's a seed with a juicy pulp that surrounds the bean. It's called cascara. And 25 billion pounds of green coffee were produced globally last year, but four times as much cascara was also produced as a byproduct. Most cascara is literally thrown away, piled into literal mountains in landfills, 
producing methane gas equivalent to the emissions of 3 million cars each year. But the amazing thing is that the folks at Riff have a solution. They are upcycling this delicious cascara into a carbon neutral plant powered energy drink called Energy Plus. Cascara is an incredible gift of nature. It is delicious, it's naturally sweet, and it's naturally caffeinated. They've turned it into Riff Energy Plus Immunity, which has 120 milligrams of caffeine, a daily dose of vitamin C, and comes in three delicious flavors, Booyah Berry, Get It Guava, and Pick It Up Pomegranate. All of which are so good, but the Pick It Up Pomegranate got a little something special. To learn more about Riff's mission and their new Riff Energy Plus Immunity, just visit Let's Riff dot com use the code good 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 for 20 percent off your order one more time that's let's riff dot com and the code good 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 sounds good is sponsored by libro fm libro fm is the company that lets you support a local bookstore every time you download an audiobook now you've probably heard ads for libro fm's giant competitor. They are owned by this giant mega corporation. I'm sure you've heard of them. Now, here's the thing. Libro FM has all the same audiobooks, has the same price, but every time you download an audiobook with Libro FM, you help support a local bookstore. That's the difference. By choosing Libro FM, you keep money within your local economy, you create local jobs, and you make a difference in your community. And so today, I'm encouraging you, if you're already a subscriber with that other company, make the switch. Just move on over to Libro FM. And here's the good news. Libro FM is offering two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with the code GOOD. All you have to do is visit the website Libro.fm, that's L-I-B-R-O dot F-M, and use the promo code GOOD to get started with two audiobooks and to help make a difference. I would love to just kind of hear more of these conversations of what it looks like for opposing groups to come together through history and to figure out where their common interests are. And I'm sure there's a million of those stories, but they're just a little bit less. They're going to get a little bit less attention. People are going to like them a little bit less, but maybe they're a more effective or an effective way of of creating solutions. Um, kind of on a on another point. I think about your story, your your chapter that you did on Pete Souza, who I've also had the pleasure of meeting, interviewing. He's delightful. And he, perhaps uniquely in your book, doesn't seem to immediately identify as an activist. And, and you kind of grapple with that in the book. I think that may be kind of relatable for a lot of people who you know, are just doing what they think should be done, You know, to quote Pete Souza, like, he thinks that that's just what he needed to be doing as a citizen. Uh, it was just his responsibility with the unique opportunities in front of him. And so I'm curious, how often do you think that that's the case that someone is, you know, by every definition, an activist without fully realizing it or naming it? Yeah, I think that pizzas is a great example, but there are other ones too, of people who are going about their lives. You know, they didn't, you know, they're not in sort of the, typical political activist out there fighting mm. this policy or that bill or whatever, but see something and really respond to it and just say, no, you know what? That's not right. And for whatever reason, I have the, I'm in the right place. I have the right connections. I have the right viewpoint that I can say something about it, or I can show something about it in the case of Pete Souza with his Instagram feed, you know, when, when your conscience is pricked and you feel like I can't, I can't be quiet, you know? And I think that what is great about Pete's story and a, you know, a few others in the story, several others in the book also, you know, one, um, Jason Charger, who was one of the early Standing Rock activists, you know, had very little exposure to any of that. And then just sort of started realizing, you know, what the issue was. And just, you know, she and a bunch of kids showed up to the call um, that was put out on Indian radio for people to come help protest Standing Rock. And she talks about getting there and the the chiefs being like, well, we thought, a bunch of chiefs were going to come and it's a bunch of kids. Like, what are you kidding me? <laughs> and, but, you know, they decided, look, we can do something. And so they came and she had very little exposure to that before, but realized she was in a position to do something and had the time and she was going to do it. 
or Sister Megan Rice, who was a great story, who didn't do any actions. She did her first action when she was 86 years old. Wow. And yeah, but she said, you know, she was part of uh, the Plowshares, which is sort of a a Catholic group of um, peace activists. And they were contemplating doing this action against a nuclear facility in Tennessee. And they go. They did the reckoning the night before, and it was a bunch of people sitting around, and most people were younger and had families and jobs. And she had retired, and she thought, "How could I not do this?" You know, which I think is such a great question. You know, well, a lot of people would say, "Well, yeah, I don't really want to do that," but she thought, "You know, listen, I'm actually in a position where I can," you know. And so she and two other people snuck into this facility, you know, clipped through the wires of a fence surrounding one of the nuclear facilities in Tennessee. And, you know, lit some candles and had a protest because she knew, as they all did, that they could face jail time. And she was, in fact, um, convicted and spent two years in jail then, which, of course, then people go, oh, my gosh, that's so terrible. And she was like, no, no, it was actually a real privilege. And then she goes on and talks about the amazing people she met there. So and again, maybe that's not everyone's cup of tea, clearly. But the fact is that any point in your life, if you find yourself in a situation where you have something to say about something, then you can do it. And it doesn't have to be dramatic, but if it feels in line with who you are, I think there's something that's very freeing about that. I heard that again and again, whether it was from John Lewis talking about the first time he was arrested or others saying, you know, or Marion Wright Edelman, just talking about the fact that you, in some ways, you are putting yourself in danger and certainly in discomfort. But at the same time, you just felt this sense of ease, like, you know, your conscience was soothed basically because you thought this is what I need to be doing. And even though it seems like I'm going into this stressful, bad situation, I actually feel better because I, I'm not in conflict with myself anymore. Like, you know, if you see something that's wrong and you don't do anything, that's not a good feeling. And so figuring out what you can do. And and so for all of us, whether it's something large or small, you know, something that we can do that's in line with what we believe. I think that's so beautiful and profound. And and as my final question before we wrap up, I know that your book isn't necessarily laid out this way. Your book is laid out in the form of, of people's stories and their own words. But through the process of, of bringing this together, I'm curious to hear if you were to almost break down how can somebody become an activist like those that you profiled in activists? I think the main thing is you just you listen to your conscience, right? We, we're all, there's not one right way to be. There's not one right way to go about it. And that is one thing that you see in these stories is that there's so many different angles that people came from. You know, I mean, Jaina Trina Zweiman is a good example. She is one of the founders of the Pussy Hat Project. That came out of her um, disability. She had, had been injured. Her back had gotten injured in some weird freak accident. And so she could barely walk. And so she was sort of in this period of recovery. And yet, you know, the lead up to the 2016 election was happening and there was all this negativity. And then um, Donald Trump was elected president. And, you know, she was frustrated and offended by his treatment of women, the way he talked about them and, and wanted to go to the, to the march in DC, you know, the big march right after his inauguration in 2017. And she couldn't travel because of her injured back. And so she's, you know, she was part of a knitting circle you know, out of a, a knitting place in LA. And she just, and they were, she was like, oh, I wish I could go. You guys have to go and take something for me. And so they said, oh, let's knit a hat. And so they, you know, sort of, you know, so then they started improbably this idea to knit all of these pink hats, you know, that look like pussy cats, you know. And so, you know, and then it sort of took off. And it was this thing that, you know, she just wanted to be there and represent in some way. And she knew how to knit. And she was a good organizer and she sort of had interest in art and stuff like that. And so they came up with this whole protest thing that made this massive visual statement, but, you know, didn't set out to do that. You know, it was just sort of something that came and evolved. But the point is, she was going about her life. She had something that bothered her and she figured out one little step she could take. And then, oh, wow, that's kind of cool. It catches on. So then she takes the next step and the next, and then she's sending them all over the country. You know, and then all the people who were sick, who had cancer or whatever, who couldn't make it, had a way of, of being there. They sent hats to people to wear. And so it was really this wonderful way to connect. Um, but it was authentic. It was just, you know, it wasn't like, oh, well, I'm going to call my congressperson and I'm going to write these letters, you know, sort of the typical political way. It was 
you know, using her craft. You know, now it's called craftivism, right? You know, so there are all different ways that people can do it. So basically, you just, you focus on what bothers you, and then you, you take a step to fix it. It's, you know, it's pretty easy. So it's, you know, no complaining, or complain if you want, but, but also do something about it, right? Little step, little something concrete. You, know, you don't have to solve the world. You don't have to have a, a band of hundreds. You know, you go out there and Bob Kafka, who was also in this, you know, was in a wheelchair, couldn't get around Texas, Austin, Texas, where he was living because, you know, the, the um, transportation was not accessible. And so he and I think two other wheelchairs got out and blocked traffic, you know, and so it's like little <laughs> things, little things. It doesn't take money. It doesn't take, a, you know, a band of others to join you. It's sort of like whatever, just whatever your special thing is. Like for me, I'm trying to tell these stories because that's what I do. That's what I know how to do, you know, stories and pictures. So put it together and try to help people think about what they can do and and hold up these stories for the rest of us to to learn from. I think that is so beautiful and so profound and so actionable because we all have something. We We all have something that's unique to us and we all have opportunities that will present themselves. And all we have to do is take that first step and then we'll see what happens next. Yeah. And one thing I would add to that is also, you know, some people, many people highlighted the importance of community in doing that. You know, find find other people who are interested or who have those talents or who are in that area and, and do it together. Because one, you know, it, it's, it can be more effective and it spreads out. And also it can be more fulfilling and more fun, more inspiring, you know, to do it with other people. That is K.K. Audison, journalist, photographer, and the author of Activist, Portraits of Courage. You can buy her book wherever you buy books, and I highly recommend you do. The print book is absolutely gorgeous, so inspiring. The audiobook is also special. Just make sure that you get the chance to pick it up. You can also follow K.K. on Instagram. She's at kk.audison. That's at kk.audison. O-T-T-E-S-E-N. This podcast was created by Good Good Good. At Good Good Good, we help you feel more hopeful and do more good. You can find more good news and ways to make a difference in our weekly email newsletter, our beautiful print good newspaper, or online at goodgoodgood.co. This episode was created by Kaylee Thompson, Megan Burns, and me, Brandon Harvey. It was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. If you want to support the show, there are two things you can do. First, just please make sure that you hit the follow button wherever you listen to podcasts. That way you can get a new episode of Sounds Good delivered right to your phone while you sleep every Monday. And then second, if you have a favorite episode of the show or you loved this episode, do us a favor and head on over to Spotify. When you get there, find this episode, hit the share button, and post about it to your Instagram stories. It is a great way to share all of our episodes about creating good news and taking good action. And with that, that is a wrap for this week's episode. Go out and take one simple action step to make the world better, and we will be back next week with more good news and good action. Sound good?